Hi, I'm Gareth Green, and in this video, we're going to think about how to compose a piece of music using the whole tone scale. So, this may be your thing, it may not be your thing, but there are quite a number of composers that I've been working with recently who said, well, I've got quite good at working with conventional harmony, I'm reasonably happy working in major and minor keys, I'd like to branch out, do something else, maybe I want to try composing with serialism or something, maybe I want to do something that feels a little less rigid than that, or maybe feels a little bit less dissonant potentially than that, well, the whole tone scale is a possible avenue for discovery. There are lots of different ways in which you could compose using the whole tone scale, but one thing about it is it's going to take you away from harmonic conventions, because the most obvious thing to say about working with the whole tone scale is that it doesn't really allow you to work in a major key or a minor key or to work in some kind of mode or something. So it's really just putting you into a new place. So let's first of all be entirely clear what we're talking about when we talk about the whole tone scale. So if I start a scale on C and I progress up in whole tones, well, a tone above C is D. Go up another tone, E. Go up another tone, F sharp up another tone, G sharp, up another tone, A sharp, up another tone, I come back to C. So there is a whole tone scale. Now, does it have to be F sharp, G sharp, A sharp? Absolutely not. It could be that you treat these notes enharmonically and call them G flat, A flat, B flat. All perfectly possible because we're not registering this in relation to any conventional key, we're not really bound by any particular way of labeling the note. I mean, if you're in G major, then you use F sharp because that is the raised seventh degree of a scale of G major. You don't call it G flat, you call it F sharp. Well, actually in the whole tone scale, we haven't got the same points of reference. So you can decide what works best in any given moment. So there's a whole tone scale on C. C, D, B, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, C. Okay, or C, D, E, G flat, A flat, B flat, C. It's got a very distinctive sound, doesn't it? And a lot of music by composers like Debussy is using the whole tone scale, for example. So it's a sound that you might be quite familiar with. Okay, well, if that's the whole tone scale on C, well, when we're talking about major and minor scales, we've got loads of different keys we can use. So can we do that in the whole tone thing? Are there loads of different keys we can use? Well, no, there aren't, because of the nature of these all being whole tones, that's what the scale is, it's all whole tones. It's not a combination of tones and semitones. However, it's possible for this to transpose. So if I take this C up a semitone, so let's call it C sharp, although again, it could be D flat. So C sharp up a tone will be D sharp, won't it? If I go up a tone there, it could be E sharp or it could be F, up a tone G, upper tone A, uh, upper tone there will be B, and then I'll be back to C sharp again. But as I say, this could easily be called D flat, E flat if you wanted it to be, with possibly D flat at the top. So here's the original transposition, C, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, C. Here it is transposed up a semitone, C sharp, D sharp, F, G, A, B, C sharp. But those are the only two transpositions that you can have of a whole tone scale. Now, why do I say that? Well, we started with C, we went up a semitone to C sharp. If I go up another semitone to D, well, I end up back here, don't I? So I end up back on this scale. I go D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, C, D. 
If I go up another semitone, D sharp, well, I end up back here, don't I? So D sharp, F, G, A, B, C sharp, D sharp. So there's nowhere else to go. These are the only two transpositions that will work for you. But you can start anywhere you like within either of those transpositions. Well, one thing you could do if you are writing a piece using a whole tone scale uh, is to mix and match those two transpositions. It's a possibility. Quite often you find that composers don't do that. They go for one or the other because sometimes the combination throws up something that's much more dissonant. So if you're wanting to experiment with that, go for it. Sometimes you might think, well, I might write a piece in a whole tone scale in some kind of ternary structure, sort of A, B, A. I might use one transposition in the A sections and the other transposition in the B section. That could be one way of doing it. After that, how do we go about writing a piece of music? Well, in every other respect, it could be entirely conventional, couldn't it? But you're going to use your whole tone scale to derive melodic ideas and also your harmonic ideas. Once you've done that, well, what are you gonna do with rhythm? Much the same as you've probably been doing for years. You're gonna possibly work in a time signature and devise different rhythmic ideas that you want to use in your piece. You're gonna think about texture in much the same way that you have done all this time. Is it going to be melody and accompaniment? Is it going to be block chords? What are we going to do? Are we going to have figuration in some accompanying thing? Is it going to be two parts? Is it going to be four parts? All those are reasonably conventional decisions. And it's up to you how radical you want to be with these other elements. But in a sense, that's separate from working with a whole tone scale. We can write the whole piece in 4-4. Four, four. We can have changing time signatures every bar, whatever you want to do. But what I'm going to do now is just sort of start to work a few ideas with the whole tone scale, just so we begin to sort of think, well, how would we actually turn this into something? Well, let's start by thinking melodically. Well, let's perhaps have a time signature to work with, so why not go for 4-4? Four, four? Do I need to have a key signature? Well, you could do, but to be honest, when you're working with a whole tone scale, it's a lot easier not to have one. You're not in a key, so why try and pretend that you are? Uh, so I think it's usually easier just to work without a key signature. Okay, well, if we're going to write a melody, what are the things that we think about? We want to have a balance between conjunct and disjunct movement in a conventional melody. You may decide you want to go for something that's more conjunct, more disjunct, whatever the character of your piece is going to be. But let's say we're going to start with something that's reasonably conjunct. Well, uh, let's get some kind of rhythmic identity into this. So if I start on C, I'm going to use the first transposition here. And then let's write a little melodic idea that maybe just does something very simple, like use the first few notes of the scale. Okay, so how about that for an opening bar? So I've just got a melodic idea using the first five notes of the whole tone scale. Okay, well we can decide on a tempo and a dynamic and all the rest of it later. As I say, those are all conventional decisions. But there's a melodic idea, isn't it? So. What am I going to do with this idea? Well, I could develop it in some way. So maybe I'm just going to have that as a, an opening statement. It sort of feels to me to be quite ethereal. So we'll have that there. Maybe we'll put PP. And then maybe we'll have a quite a slow tempo. All these things are the things that give it its character, its mood. You know, you could decide you're going to play Allegro, Fortissimo, Staccato. That would be a very different opening, wouldn't it? But it's the same notes. But so different, isn't it? Much more evocative there, isn't it? OK, well, there's an opening melodic idea. Now, maybe what I want to do then in the next bar 
is to have something that's maybe a little bit more harmonic. So how about I get something going in the left hand where I'm going to treat this harmonically. Quite often you'll find that when you're thinking harmonically, thirds and sixths work quite well as they do in conventional writing. Thirds work particularly well. Well, how about I do something in the left hand now where I just set up some thirds. Uh, so if we do something like this, we'll just maybe oscillate these two thirds. Okay, so there's a harmonic idea that's just evolving in the left hand now. And then where's it going to go? Well, we could move up another third. So having done a bar of this, I might move up to the next third and finish it with something like that. Okay. And then we might think, okay, well, that's got something going in the left hand. It's got something a little bit more harmonic going. We're possibly going to have a rest in the first bar. So we introduce that right hand idea. And then we have this left hand thing. Okay. And we could have that all going kind of legato as well. By the time we get there, well, we might be ready for the right hand to do something slightly different. So uh, let's have a right hand rest in the second bar. One thing that works quite well when you're in a sort of quiet, reflective mood with this stuff is to have quite a bit of space in the score. So just a, a monophonic opening, then just these chords. You know, it's a way of making an evo evocative start about the whole thing. Now, can the right hand then use this idea to kind of take the piece forwards? Well, possibly what I could do is something like this, but invert it so it's descending. So why don't I do start with a C at the top of the scale and then use this idea. And this is an example of thinking enharmonically. Now, you might think, well, why did I use sharps on the way up? but flats on the way down. It's partly just kind of like how you're going to read this stuff as the player, isn't it? That this seems more logical, doesn't it? We're moving up a note, so some kind of D, so some kind of C to some kind of D to some kind of E to some kind of F to some kind of G. They're all going by step. Some kind of C to some kind of B to some kind of A to some kind of G makes it more sensible notationally to use sharps when you're going up there, to use flats when you're coming down here. But that's entirely your call. It's just from a player's perspective, it would be easier to read that as C to B flat to A flat to G flat rather than to see C followed by A sharp. You'd be thinking, oh my goodness, where's that? It's easier to read it with the flats going down. So there's no reason why you have to use flats or sharps, but it's making the point that you can think enharmonically. Okay. So you see what I've done here? I've used this opening idea. And in this third bar, I'm just using it coming the other way by inversion. And then it sort of wants to go on to that, doesn't it? So maybe what we could now do is to kind of use this left hand idea. So that would complete that. But maybe go into the third. So I'm starting to adopt this plan here. And maybe what I'll do is use the rhythm in diminution. So instead of using crotchets or coordinates, I'll use these quavers. And then, you know, instead of it being a predictable rhythm, because I could do the same rhythm, you know, equal, even notes. Maybe I could dot it this time. So we do something like 
to this and then move on to the final left hand chord in this bar. So you see what I'm trying to do now? Use this left hand idea, rhythmic diminution, but changing the rhythm so there's some sense of development about the thing, you know? So maybe that's going to be my next little phrase statement in the right hand. So what have we got so far? We've got this right hand thing. And then the left hand. Then the right hand joining by inversion. So you see how that started to evolve. And then maybe the left hand can pick up and imitate this figure a little bit. Just an idea. I mean, you can do exactly what you want with your own composition, but this is just kind of a practical hands-on with, well, what are the things that you could do? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to adopt this right-hand pattern, but I'm just going to transpose it up a little bit. Um, and then we'll use the rhythm that the right hand used. But there's a kind of development about it because it's transposed up. And so we're going to... And then maybe it naturally flows onto here. And if I again think enharmonically, does it make sense after these notes to read G sharp and B sharp, or does it make sense to read A flat and C? Well, we've been in a world of sharp, so I'm sticking with the sharps there. So do you see where our composition is beginning to go? So what have we got so far? We've got this. the opening few bars of a possible composition. Well, where's it going to go from here? Lots of options. I mean, I could carry on working with this idea, imitate it in the right hand here. We could have a totally new idea that's maybe more staccato, maybe more disjunct, but lots of different ways. But what I'm trying to show you is that actually the, the kind of conventions are still present in many respects. It's just that we're finding a way of working with the whole tone scale and having some confidence about doing that, but still empowered by the knowledge that we have working with rhythm and textures, with melody, with harmony, and all the rest of it. Anyway, I hope that's useful as a, just a very kind of practical, hands-on, let's just evolve the first few bars of the composition using a whole tone scale. And if you've enjoyed this video, well, have a look at our website, www.mmcourses.co.uk, where you can find details of all our many courses on theory, oral skills, keyboard harmony, composition, analysis, lots of other things besides. So there may be many things there that are of particular use to you. Other information there, blogs and so on, that you might enjoy reading too. Or you might want to join our maestros group. Lots of perks that come with being a Music Matters maestro, including discounts on our online courses and the ability to attend a monthly live stream where we really get into the depths of the work of a composer or some musical aspect where we can answer people's questions as well. And then we have another group which is for practical musicians, for composers, for performers, for people who are preparing for exams, wanting to do harmony exercises, that kind of thing, where you can submit your work and have personal feedback on what you're doing. Uh, very supportive groups. You'll be surrounded by like-minded musicians all in the same kind of pursuit. And we have these lovely monthly encounters. So if that's for you, you'll also see that on the homepage of the website, there's a Maestro's link that you can click to find out more. So do come and join us in whatever way suits you best.